Last week we started a new series on how do we live by faith? How do we grow as Christians? Or how do we become obedient? And we said that sometimes people are a little bit confused about being grateful or being thankful. And we think, well, the attitude is, well, God's done so much for us, what are we going to do for him? And we said, that doesn't really produce obedience. And we looked at the Old Testament. And the Old Testament says that the problem that Israel had in obeying God was that they didn't believe the promises of God. It always gets down to faith. The more I believe that what God has done for me, and I believe that God's plans for me are good in Christ, and that he, he's working things all together for good, the more I want to obey him. But when I'm not so confident in God, that God's in charge, that God means things for good, then I sometimes turn to my own sinful ways of getting things done. I heard a story about a pastor that was speaking on this subject, about how we're not trying to pay God back, but continue to walk by faith in his continuing grace, and there was a missionary in the audience that came up and spoke to him at the end of the service. And this was a missionary who had spent a number of years in the Philippines. And he came up to the pastor and said, did you know that this idea of trying to pay God back is something that often occurs uh, in the Filipino culture? And, and, and then the man explained something, and I'm sure I'm going to say it wrong, something in that culture called utang na lub. And... Uh, it, utang na lub is, could be translated very roughly as debt of volition. And somebody who benefits from a good deed, like if I do something good for you, then in that culture you're sort of obligated to me for the rest of your life. So you know, in a way, you know, you, you're, you're available at my beck and call because I did something nice for you, so you, you owe me something as long as you live. So you see, it's good to be thankful when somebody does something nice for us. But there can also be some negative aspects if you feel like you have to always be paying someone back. See, in this, in Utang Na Lub, the person who receives a benefit never knows when they've done enough to pay their benefactor back. Uh, so they wind up always feeling, it can be almost like a slave. There are spiritual dangers this, when we have the same idea and we bring it into our relationship with the Lord. We bring it into our, our Christian life. Because in every human heart, there is this tendency to want to try to pay God back. Like, we, like it's a business transaction. So we, we all know, we think of in our relationship with God in terms of what he has done for us. In Christ going to the cross for us or in past answered prayer. And that's a very good thing. But then when we start thinking, well, that means... I have a debt to pay him. Well, that's not good. We do, we do not honor God. We do not honor God by t trying to repay him for his grace. Grace, by its very definition, is something given to us freely that we don't deserve. You can't pay it back. See, we honor God when we believe his promises. When we believe he's been gracious to us, he's going to keep on being gracious to us not because we earn it, not because we perform well enough, because that's just what he does for us in Jesus Christ. And we can rely on him to provide whatever we need. Five minutes from now, five days from now, 50 years from now, he'll always be there for us. And we saw this a little bit last time, last week when we were looking at the Old Testament. But some of the same ideas in the New Testament. Now, if you'll notice, we were just reading from Hebrews chapter 11. And verse 7 said that by faith, Noah, being warned by God concerning events as yet unseen. I mean, there was, Noah had never seen a flood before, but God told him there was going to be a flood. So in reverent fear, he built an ark to save his household. And by this, he condemned the world, and he exposed their sin, and became an heir of the righteousness that comes by faith. You see, Noah was completely motivated he obeyed God because he believed what God said. Everyone else looked around and said, what, what are you building that for? What's a flood? We don't know what that even is. But Noah said, God said it. He said he's going to save me and anybody else who gets in this boat. So I'm going to obey him. I'm going to build the ark because I believe what God has said. And I trust him to bring salvation. 
Or you think of Abraham. He obeyed God when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance, but it was a joke. It was a group of nomads. They were a bunch of nobodies. And God gives them promises, this big land that's going to be theirs. And yet that land was, was, was controlled by a big tribes, other nations. And, and Abraham and his clan were so little. But he believed the promise of God, so he obeyed him and went out living in tents. See, again, you see, it's his confidence that God was going to come through for him and do what he said that produced obedience. When John Huss, in the early 1400s, the reformer in uh, Bohemia, what we today call the Czech Republic, he was, he was sentenced to be uh, burned at the stake. And they chained his neck to a, a stake and they tied his hands behind his back. And as they lit the flames around him, the guy started singing a hymn. How do you sing a hymn when you're a shish kebab? How do you do that? Because you believe in the promises of God. You believe, Jesus said, great is your reward in heaven because I've won it for you with my blood. So he said, I'm going to sing when I'm being burned at this stake. He trusted that God would get him through the burning into glory. And it's his faith that enabled him to obey. And when we go through the Bible, it is always that way. It's our faith that causes us to obey God. The Bible does not say that because of his thankfulness, Abraham obeyed. Now, I suspect he was probably very thankful at times. But the real motivation was he believed in God's continuing grace and provision for him. Uh, Paul, in, uh, you don't have to turn there, but in 1 Thessalonians 1.3, Paul talks about the work, the Christian obedience is of faith. It's, it's our confidence in God that causes us to say, I'm going to do what he says. Paul doesn't call it the work of gratitude, but the work of faith. The apostle Paul in Galatians 2.20 says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live, he doesn't say I live by gratitude or gratefulness. He says, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and delivered himself up for me. 2 Corinthians 5, Paul says, we walk by faith and not by sight. He doesn't say, now, we walk by gratefulness and not by sight. Now, that doesn't mean it's, it's not, we're not saying it's not important to be grateful, but that's not the real octane in the tang that gets us to obey God. Now, look at the screen at Matthew 6.30. Here's Jesus speaking to some very worried, anxious people. He says, But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, oven will he not much more clothe you, O you of little faith? See, Jesus, the cure he offers them for our worry is faith. He says, if you would trust God more, you wouldn't be so anxious. He doesn't say, oh, you of little gratefulness. No, he says, you of little faith. Now, don't get me wrong. Being grateful to God, being thankful is a, is a beautiful thing. In fact, that's why we're here. I mean, being thankful is the heart of worship. We're thankful to God for what he has done and what he will do for us. However, it does not drive practical Christian obedience. Faith in who God says he is to us and faith in what God promises to do for us moves us to obey. You know, when Abraham went out, he, did, he just went out and he didn't know where he was going. I mean, he had this promise from God. It looked like it was against all odds he was going to become a great nation. He went out. He didn't know where he was going, but he did know who was going with him. He had faith in the one who traveled with him. It's like the Israelites when they came out of Egypt. There was a pillar of cloud to lead them by day, a pillar of fire by night. They didn't always know exactly where they were going to go and how long they were going to stay there, but they knew who went with them. And the same is true for you. You can always know that the God who promises, I'll never leave you, I'll never forsake you, he will always be with you, and you can know that. And he means what he brings into your life for good. It's part of his good purposes. You know, if we try to pay God back the way you may tr pay back your credit card company, then we change God's free grace into some kind of a business deal. And then we're no longer treating grace like grace, because grace is to be understood as something just given freely to those who don't deserve it. 
Uh, I have an illustration that John Piper, uh, he uses. Picture your salvation as a home that you live in. And, and, and everything you need is in this home. Uh, it provides you with protection. Say it's stocked with food that will last forever. Uh, it will never, dec- never decay, never crumble. The windows open up on beautiful views of the glory of God. And God built that home for you at great expense to himself. It cost his own, the, the life of his own son dying on the cross for you. But his son paid the price, and then God flat out gave it to you. Here, here's a house taken with provisions. It's yours forever and ever. And the purchase agreement is called a new covenant, sealed by the blood of Jesus. And the terms read like this. This house is yours as a free gift. God absorbs the entire cost for building and maintaining and stocking the house forever, paid in full by Jesus Christ. If you were then to, on your own, draw up a a mortgage schedule to pay God back, you'd be crazy. It's already paid in full. You don't need to pay a mortgage. It's 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 paid for and then given to you. See, then you'd no longer be treating your salvation like a free gift, but like it's some kind of a purchase. And then you'd no longer be viewing or treating God like your gracious provider, but like, again, some kind of a a guy you're doing business with. And you would start living more like a slave, trying to pay God back under a set of demands that God never dreamed of putting you under. It wasn't his idea. Look at the screen. Here's an old song. I think it came out, what, the 70s, early 80s? Oh, be ye glad, oh, be ye glad. Every debt that you ever had has been paid up in full by the grace of the Lord. Be glad, be glad, be glad. Every debt that you've ever had has been paid up in full by the grace of the Lord. See, the Bible is always telling us to remember God's past grace, what he's done for us. In fact, the Jewish people, they'd always observe the Passover, and they would remember year after year how God saved them from Egypt and led them into freedom. Uh, the Jewish people would observe the Feast of Booths or shelters. And many Orthodox Jews still do this. They live in like temporary shelters in late September, early October. And they rem- are reminded that when they came out of Egypt, God, and they, they had no permanent home, but God was taking care of them. We're going to go to the Lord's table in a little while. And when we take communion, among other things, we remember Christ secured our place in glory forever by his death and resurrection. We're going to be reminded of his past grace. However, when it comes to living the Christian life, we don't live in the past. See, you don't obey Christ in the past. You obey him today, or looking to to obey him as when new things come into your life. We never pray, oh God, help me to be faithful to you and obey you last Tuesday. No, we Tuesday's gone. We pray that we'll obey him moment by moment as we go throughout our day today into the future. Uh, See, there's a divine power for ongoing obedience to God. It's called faith. It's believing that everything God says he's going to do, who he is to you, that he's your loving father, that you're adopted, that you're in the will, that he hears your prayers, that he's working all things together for good. Believing that is where obedience comes from. See, being thankful says... Look at all that God has done for you. Isn't it wonderful? And it is. But the problem is in our brain, we sometimes then we, we twist that. And then we say, well, I, we, you better live better for God. You better start working harder for God to pay God back. See, and that's when what we call the debtor's ethic starts to take over. And we start relying on our performance so that God will keep us or, or really want to bless us. And then, see, that's a subtle kind of legalism. We're not living by faith anymore. We're looking at ourselves. See, but when you and I are confident that God will provide everything we need in the future, uh, and and we're confident that God is always good towards us, and that he is always going to be faithful to us, that makes us want to obey. Supposing you're in a situation at work, and you have a boss that asks you to do something that's unethical. Well, right away, your mind starts thinking, oh, no, what do I do? If I, if, I diso- if I do what my boss tells me to do, I'm doing something morally wrong. But if I disobey my boss, I'm going to get fired, and my kids will be hungry. What am I going to do? And that, that's, there's a dilemma. 
Faith says, hey, God's taking care of you, right? If you lose your job, God still can provide for you and for your family. And so because of faith, you say, I'm going to be honest, and I am not going to do something unethical, no matter who wants me to do it. You see, it's the faith that enables you to stand firm in a difficult situation. Or supposing you're in a situation with talking with a, an unbelieving friend and some people are around and uh, the opportunity comes up in your conversation, real naturally, to talk about God, to talk about Christ. I mean, the door just springs open. It's obviously, you, you walk right through it, but then you're, you're, you think, oh, no, wait a minute. But people, maybe, maybe they won't understand me. Maybe people won't like it. Maybe it'll jeopardize my friendships. What am I going to do? Well, faith says, you know what? God's the Lord of friends. God can take care of me. I'm going to do what God wants me to do. That's the good life anyway. I'm going to obey him. I'm going to speak about Christ and let, let the chips fall. With it. Let God take care of how other people respond to me. That's his problem. You see, and through faith, you obey. Or supposing you're deeply hurt and everyone around you says, you got to get back at that person. I mean, most, there are some Hollywood movies that deal with forgiveness, but a lot of them are all about getting revenge, blowing away the other guy. But supposing you've been hurt, and everyone around you saying, yeah, you got to get back at him, get back at him. You think, yeah, yeah, it would feel good to get back at that person. And yeah, that's what everyone else is doing. That's the conventional wisdom. But then your faith says, wait a minute, Christ has forgiven me. I trust God with my life. I, God is going to bring out perfect justice in his own time. I'm going to trust God and forgive that person anyway. See, faith is what causes us to be more godly in, situ in, in difficult situations that come into our life. Now look at the screen. I'm going to show you a quote from Andrew Murray. He died about a, well, 100 years ago this year. He was a Dutch Reformed pastor. He's written a lot of books about prayer. Some of you maybe have encountered him before. But he wrote this. I paraphrased a little bit to make it more understandable. The idea many Christians have of grace is this. Their conversion and pardon are God's work, but now in gratitude to God, it is their work to live as Christians and follow Jesus. And then he says, no, as it was Jesus who drew you when he said, come, so it is Jesus who keeps you when he says, abide. The past grace to come to Christ and the future grace to remain in Christ are both from him alone. It's not grace that makes you into a Christian, and from then on, you've got to earn your keep or you've got to somehow produce. And, you know, the, God produces obedience in you and I as we believe that what he says he's going to do in our lives is true. Now, I want to end this message very quickly by pointing out, I, I don't want you to think I'm saying being thankful is a bad idea or something. It's important to be thankful. Um, uh, see, as gratitude, thankfulness rejoices in the benefits of what God has done for you, done for us in the past. Faith re joyfully relies on the benefits of God's grace in, in the future, day by day, moment by moment. So when gratitude to God's past grace is strong, when we're, we're, we're thankful, oh God, I can't believe you forgave all my sins. Oh, God, that's, that's wonderful. You've taken care of me. I can see that in my life. That, some, that sends a message inside of you that God must be completely trustworthy so you'll trust him in the next situation that comes into your life that's difficult for you. So you see, being thankful strengthens your faith that leads to obedience. Now, what we're going to do next week is we're going to talk a lot about applying this this idea of living by faith to combating anxiety. We're, we all worry at times. Most all of us experience anxiety or a knot in our stomach. Some, some of us experience that a lot. We're going to talk about how does living by faith in God's promises help us combat something like anxiety. And we'll see it all, it all comes down to believing. It's not just about being thankful enough so you're not worried, but it's by trusting what God has said that helps alleviate the worry. I want to close this message with a, with a story. This is it's by a guy named, this took place about 10 years ago, a fellow by the name of Yahya Wahab who lived in Malaysia. And his father died, died in January of 2006. And so Yahya paid off the, the, his father's phone. He had his phone disconnected and paid off the remaining bill, which came to like 23 U.S. dollars. And then closed up the account. Then in April, a few months later, he received another bill 
from the phone company, and he opened it up, and it was a bill for, in U.S. dollars, $213 trillion. And it's, it was a threatening note. It said, if you don't, if you don't pay this back in 10 days, we're going to prosecute. Now, I'm assuming it was either a, a, a computer error or else some underworld people had gotten a hold of the old line and were using it for evil purposes. I don't know. But one thing is for sure. Yahia Wahab could never pay back $213 trillion. You remember, if, we, if we're going to live our lives by what we have to pay God back to be his children, to be forgiven, to, to be in his family, I got news for you. We can never pay that debt. But the debt was paid in full by Jesus Christ. So now you're free to trust God to keep on being kind to you, keep on giving you power to serve him, and then by faith you'll want to obey more and more. Let's pray. Father, faith is so precious, Father. But sometimes we feel like trying to have faith is like trying to catch a greased pig. We, we know we're supposed to have faith. But Father, our, soul, we, we, our, our flesh, we're so weak. We get so distracted. We get so worried. We, get, we think of all the things that could go wrong, and we're just not confident that you're right there with us when these things come up, when we feel like we're, we're tempted to lie or to steal or to be dishonest or, or to keep our mouth shut or we don't want to pray. Father, strengthen our faith so we can see you for who you are and what that you are always working in our lives. And you're, you've got the most wonderful plan for us together and as individuals. And, and obedience is, the, is a wonderful thing because we know our reward in heaven is great and your kindness to us now is just as great. Help us to believe it and live like it. And if we do, Father, that is such good news. If we really believe it, we are in your hand all the time. We've got a good story to tell other people, to, uh, to unbelievers and to believers as well. So Father, strengthen our faith. 